Welcome to Mistaro, where today we're answering one of the oldest questions in D&D. What's the difference between our gnomes and everybody else's gnomes? And the answer is, ours are competent. Yes, they make incredibly complex magical devices that sometimes defy any and all logic, but ours work. Biplanes, pinball machines, tanks, ornithopters, even a flying city. All were designed by the gnomes, and all of them work devastatingly well. That's why the subject of this video is the Ustok gnomes, a nation of artificers trapped in the hollow world, and builders of fine, high-quality airships. When you're trapped on a floating island miles above the surface, you get really good at building airships. I'm Mr. Welch, and up in the air, Junior Birdman. The floating island of Usdok and its gnomes were first mentioned in Dragon Magazine 162 as part of the Princess Arc storyline. Their story arc was then concluded in Dragon 163. Here the gnomes encounter Prince Haldemar and help him and his ship escape the Haldonic warbirds that are actively searching for him during their time at the center of Mastara. The gnomes, in fact, were very friendly during the encounter, partly because they're a benevolent lot, and also they're no fans of the Haldonic Order, which has conquered the islands after the gnomes helped out one of their ships. The island was once two different islands, Ostmaker and Waldock. Then one day the islands collided, got stuck together, and the two rival gnomish clans realized they were going to have to live with each other. The gnomes were represented by two large families, the Valoin and the Flamachers. Okay, they're obviously Belgian, with the allegories towards the Walloon and the Flemish. Most of the cities and airships have French-sounding names, and the first gnome the crew encounter sounds like Hercule Perrault. When you picture the cities of Ustok, think 16th century Belgian, only with shorter Belgians with bigger noses. Ustok is physically the lowest of the floating continents, only two miles above the ground. It's 30 miles wide and 50 miles long, dotted with large hills and forests along with several sizable cities, with the largest being the capital Sherbeek. The island enjoys a temperate climate, and the cities are quite advanced for the Hollow World, or even Mastara in general. This is because the gnomes have an affinity for artifice, and several guilds are devoted to making magical ships and devices to help ease the burden on the gnomes. Ustok doesn't have much contact with the civilizations on the ground for obvious reasons, and it's probably for the best. Ustok is one of the most advanced nations in all of the Hollow World, only being surpassed by the Black Lore Elves until the arrival of Alphacia. But unlike the Elves, the gnomes have the advantage of being able to leave their homes and explore. Or at least they did until the Heldonic Knights arrived. The Valoin gnomes were sent to the Hollow World when the Cobalt overran their nation on the surface in 490 AC. There is a continuity issue there, because of course there is, with the Northern Reaches saying that the Valoin gnomes were driven out 500 years before the rise of Thyatis, and the Almanacs placing the invasion 500 years after the crowning. Future books agree with the Poor Wizard's Almanacs placing the invasion in the later version of the timeline. As far as the Flamacher gnomes go, they were a serene based clan that pushed magical science a little too far and were going to be wiped out by being sent to an inhospitable plane, before the Immortals stepped in and redirected the doomed gnomes to the safety of the Hollow World. The two gnomish nations thrived in the Hollow World despite the heavy restrictions on magic. The Flamacher gnomes were already expert artificers and had no problem building airships as soon as they arrived. The Valoin took a little longer to develop airships, but they had to adopt or perish, floating miles above the surface. The gnomes used their airships to establish trading routes with other floating islands, and for a while the nations thrived on their own. Then in 778 AC, the islands changed course due to their large engines that had been installed and slammed into each other, creating the single nation of Usdok from the two previous gnomish kingdoms. The gnomes' lives would never be the same again. The actual damage to the islands was minimal. It was like an earthquake, but not a severe one. The gnomes made sure that everyone was okay before going to survey the damage that would become known as the Big Crash. Buildings could be repaired, the injured were healed, and the airships rebuilt, but the islands could not be separated. Both groups of gnomes blamed each other for the predicament, but it was obvious to anyone that would listen that the two islands were not breaking apart. The two clans were going to have to live with each other. This was the start of a lot of tension between the two groups. However, when the Heldonic Order arrived, the gnomes learned to put aside their differences to try to liberate their nation from the knights. For 200 years after the big crash, the gnomes did live in peace. They adjusted to the merger of their nation and all the increased competition that came with doubling the number of guilds. But then in 778 AC, all that changed. A Heldonic Warbird crashed on the island, and the gnomes being the helpful sort, fixed up both the ship and the crew, loaded them up with as many waffles as their ship could carry, and sent them on their way. The Heldonic Order then came back in force as a way of saying thank you, and quickly conquered the gnomes, enslaving them, and forcing them to make new airships, repair the ones they already have, and to mine as much gold as possible. The gnomes went from passive-aggressive bickering between each other, to aggressively passive resistance against their new conquerors. The occupation of Usdok was largely non-violent, as the gnomes were not one to engage in large-scale violence, especially against a knightly order that had no qualms about engaging in copious amounts of violence if challenged. The knights wanted the industrial might of the islands, as no one can create an airship as fast as the Usdok gnomes. Their airships were of the utmost quality, constantly being upgraded, improved, and maintained. 
If an airship became obsolete, the gnomes would think nothing of stripping it down for parts and building a brand new airship with all the latest features. It was the speed at which they could do it that most impressed the knights. Eventually, most of their airships were of gnomish build, though the gnomes only built ships from the blueprints that the knights provided them. Because of this, the airships of the Heldonic Order possessed none of the upgrades the gnomes had created for themselves. The occupation of the Heldonic Knights was doomed the minute Prince Haldemore landed the Princess Ark on the island for repairs while evading the Heldonic Warbirds. After being snatched by a gnomish airship in the middle of a great race right under the nose of the Heldonic Order, in a smashing scene that you need to read to fully appreciate, the gnomes began repairs on the Princess Ark at a breakneck pace. If you want to read about the race and the shenanigans that ensued, check out Dragon 162, which I believe Watsi put out for free somewhere online. The Princess Ark escapes, Haldemar inspires the gnomes to plot open revolt against the knights, and sooner than later. In the 1010 Wrath of the Immortals timeline, when Alphacia is blinked into the Hollow World to save them from the Immortals' blunders, Empress Ariadna is already aware of the gnomish assistance and Haldemar's promise to free Ustok. She unleashes the full might of the Alphacian military against the Heldonic Order, and quickly drives them from the island, liberating the gnomes in 1010. She doesn't occupy the islands, she's more than happy to have an ally in the strange new lands. Besides, Alphacia can easily crush all the Bronze Age civilizations below with ease, no reason to make enemies right off the bat. In the 1005 War on All Sides timeline, Prince Haldemar remembers the promise he made to the gnomes, and approaches the Empress with a request for aid. Alphacia is in bad shape after the disastrous stalemate in Thyatis, and she needs a win. She is able to gain the support of a few wizards in possession of several military-grade airships. All she has to do is promise the wizards any and all loot they can find in the Hollow World. The Order is routed from the island, in no small part to the superior quality of the Alphacian airships, and the gnomes unleashing several newly devised weapons on the knights as they move to engage the Alphacians. In the past, the gnomish islands had giant engines they used to fly around to get closer to other islands so they could be mined for resources. How the islands collided is a sore spot among the two gnomish clans, and they both blame each other for the collision. All the past animosity has been put aside while they slave under the control of the Heldonic occupation, but as soon as the island is freed, they will be more than happy to start blaming each other for the collision again. These islands are ruled over by several trade houses, the trade houses dating back before the Great Crash. Gnomes are born with a birthmark that identifies their trade house. Every member of a trade house is related somehow to every other member of the same trade house. Gnomes that are lazy, violate the laws, or are born illegitimately between the union of two gnomes from different trade houses, lose all rights and are cast out of society. In this case, the birthmark is removed with a brand, and the gnome has to turn to crime to survive. Brokeville is the largest weapons manufacturer in Ustak, and one of the most reviled. They create a large number of weapons used by the Heldonic Knights, though only because of coercion. Gnomes aren't allowed to own weapons, and the Knights keep the gnomes working non-stop. The Brokeville gnomes have gotten quite good about making extra copies of weapons and then hiding them from the knights. They plan to use this hidden stockpile to start a rebellion, but convincing the other gnomes to join in hasn't been easy because the other gnomes think that they're collaborators with the Heldonic Order. Dumil Maista produces the majority of the transport airships for Ustak. They're also facing the most pushback from the knights who want the gnomes to train their men in the operation of the airships, something the gnomes are adamantly opposed to. Their airships first took the form of dirigibles, and the other houses tend to copy the design due to the ease of construction. They are in talks with the Brokeville gnomes about arming their airships if they can't convince the knights to leave them alone. Hembeek, Hembeek, and Hoysevant effectively run the judiciary for all of Ustak. They are a group of lawyers that settle all legal disputes between other trade houses. They're also a nightmare for the Heldonic Order as they have learned to twist any order given because of their great legal minds. Johan Eki gnomes worldwide are the bankers of Ustak, and the primary reason for the Heldonic invasion. The gnomes are some of the best gold miners in the Hollow World, and the knights needed the gold to fund their conquests elsewhere. Johan Eki is using this against the knights by flooding their economy with gold and watching the devastating effect inflation is having on them. Les Novins Family Trust are largely comprised of artificers, and make many of the Magitech items the gnomes are famous for. They're working on a way to repair the engines from both of the former islands, allowing the gnomes to fly their island away from the knights to an orbit the warbirds have problems reaching. Montjoy Rouge operates all of the theaters and other forms of entertainment in Ustak. They also operate several brothels, but no one likes to talk about those. Because of the nature of their operation, they are the spy masters of the land and pass on information secretly through different performances. Vanden Koop Brothers operates the largest chicken farms on the island and also makes other gnomish specialties like beer you can eat with a fork, eggs on a stick, and mead horns filled with mashed potatoes. Lastly, there are the outcasts, those that have been thrown out of the various trade houses or by cruel fate never allowed to join in the first place. They actively sabotage the trade houses, work openly with the Heldonic Knights, and want nothing more than to tear down the power structure that casts them out. 
Thus concludes the Ustok gnomes. They were a latecomer to the Hollow World setting, but a flavorful one once they were introduced. They are filled with adventures for parties discovering the Hollow World. And for low-tech Hollow World parties, they are about as alien a society that can exist. Plus they have airships. Time to turn the page on the notebook, and next week we are looking at the Sylvan Races of Mastara, the non fey races from Tall Tales of the Wee Folk. Until next time, though, date yem peklo ukranio. <laughs>